We are in week two of a seven-week series called Explore God, where we are looking at some of the, the uh, most basic questions that all of humanity seems to ask about faith. Last week we asked the question, does life have a purpose? And today we ask the very simple question, is there a God? Now, before we get into uh, trying to wrestle with this question, let me just, just kind of give us a, a framework here. You may be attending today because someone invited you to come to church, or you just stumbled in, or for whatever reason, and this question may be, I mean, just really captivating to you. You struggle with this. How do I know, how can I know that there is a God? And, you know, I'm not trying to, to be so audacious to say in one 20, 30 minute message I can completely answer all of your questions, but I am uh, very prayerful that God can speak to you and pull you a step closer to the, his answer to this question. Uh, you may be here, you're a member of our church, you attend here, been attending here for decades, and you think, hey, I don't wrestle with this question, I never think about this question, I can go to sleep, wake me up when, you know, it's over kind of deal. Let me just remind you, if you were a parent, or if you were a grandparent, it is your responsibility to pass the gospel down to generations behind you, and your children and your grandchildren will wrestle with this question. And one day they will look at you as the great counselor in their life who knows everything, and grandparents don't overlook the power that you have. I mean, you're this person who comes from outside and has a bunch of money and a bunch of free time. I mean, you're just like the it, right? Uh, don't underestimate the power when they look at you and say, Granddad, how do you know that there's a God? That you have the opportunity right there to sow faith into them. And are you prepared for that question? And do you know how you'd go about If you're not a parent or a grandparent, if, if you've got a job somewhere, if you live somewhere, you've got somebody in your circle. And as shocking as it is to think, you are the most credible gospel witness in their circle. And you may be thinking, wow, they're really in a rough spot if I'm the most credible gospel. But you could be. And someday, sometime, you're going to get this question when you did not expect it. You're just walking out in the parking lot going to lunch. You think the day's over. Uh, it's just going to come at you. And are you prepared? Do you have an answer for this question? So don't just write this off and say, you know, I, I don't need this. This is for somebody else. God may be giving you this to equipping you for a conversation that you're going to have. Uh, certainly, if you are a medical, middle school student, high school student, or a college student, it is imperative. If you've not asked this question, if you just kind of grew up in the faith and have never really wrestled with this, it is imperative that you ask yourself this question so that you have an answer to this question. Now, before we actually get to the question itself, just is the question important? Is this just the kind of things that theologians wrestle with in their ivory tower? and we're debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pen and, and nobody really cares? Or does this question really mean anything? Um, this question is vitally important because it goes to the very heart of some of the most important things about what it means to be a human and to be alive. Last week we talked about the issue of purpose and we talked about how the different, you know, whether there is a God or there's not a God. And we we realize that if, if there is no God, there is no creator, there is no divine being, and there's nothing outside of nature, that means that we are just a, a product of evolution. And, and any kind of meaning that we're going to find, because it's not intrinsic in our life, because we're really no different than frogs and dogs and trees and whatever, if we're going to find any kind of meaning and purpose in life, we have to find it. We've got to create it on our own. And the human testimony and human witness is what Solomon figured out in Ecclesiastes 1. It's just all striving after the wind. Everything you're going after is just dirt, and it's very hopeless and very meaningless. Whereas if there is a God, that means God's created us uniquely and individually with a purpose in our life, if, which is to do a good work to bring Him glory, and God calls us into something that is bigger than ourselves and something that is eternal. So that's two very different worldviews, and this question goes to the very heart of that. But on, beyond just purpose, it goes to the question of morals, of, of what is right and what is wrong. I mean, if there is a creator, and there is a sustainer of the universe who is the moral ruler of the universe, and puts into the universe his rules and his definition of right and wrong, that's one thing. If, if there is no God and all that's here is nature, we really do not have any kind of objective standard of right or wrong. The only thing we can point to is personal preference, majority opinion, or power. And we know from just history that all three of those have been abused. So Adolf Hitler is kind of the poster child for this. His personal preference was one race was superior to another. He was able to convince the majority of the, of the German population to vote him. He was elected 
uh, dictator, basically, through all that process, and then he used his power to, you know, to put that philosophy into effect and murdered over seven million people. We look at all that and say, that was wrong, but by what objective standard do we look at that and say that was wrong? Just our personal preference? Just that we all know that that's wrong? Well, is there an objective standard? But here's even the bigger issue than that. If there's nothing other than nature, and what's been driving nature from the very beginning is Darwinian evolutionary theory, which is the strongest of the species survive so that they can reproduce and the weakest of the spe species fade away. If that's the only driving machine, that's a horrible ethical principle to live by. The strong do all they can to survive, even at the expense of the weak. But you're left with not much left if there is no God. So it goes to, it goes to the whole question of what is right and wrong. It goes to the question of values. What is valuable and what is meaningful? Uh, Mother Teresa's life, Adolf Hitler's life. Mother Teresa gives her life to serve the poor, and, and the least of these, Adolf Hitler used his life to exterminate 7 million people. Who lived a more beautiful life? And by what standard do you have of measuring that? If there is no divine being, how, how do you objectively say one was more beautiful than the other? Or the whole idea of justice. If there's a, if there's a God... And there's a divine being that one day is the moral ruler of the universe and we all will stand at the judgment day of Christ and this God is going to make all things right. There's hope for justice. If there's nothing outside of nature, then there's very little hope for justice. And very few of us in this room actually have any ability to impact justice in our little world. So what that means is we have absolutely very little hope of any kind of justice. So it goes, this question is vitally important because it goes to the very essence of what it means to be alive and what it means to be alive as a shared group of people. Uh, what, what's purpose in life, what's right and wrong, what's beautiful, what's valuable, and what's our hope? So is this question, I mean, sometimes we think, you know, we, we just need to talk about thing, matters about society and religion is just one of these things out here. No, this whole question about whether or not there is a God goes to the very heart of what it means to be alive and to be alive together. So it's a very important question. So let's think about it today. Is there a God? And really before we get to this... Um, you come up with this conversation, a lot of times people will say, well, you can't prove to me that there's a God. Okay, let's just level the conversational playground if we can, because the reality of the matter is you can't prove to me that there's not a God. Okay, science is, is totally unable to prove something does not exist. I mean, science cannot prove that there are no unicorns. All science can prove is we don't have any evidence right now that there are unicorns. If tomorrow we find a unicorn fossil somewhere in the wherever you'd find one of those, I don't know, and now we would say, oh, we were wrong, there is, you can't, science cannot prove something does not exist, so if I'm standing here and say, and you're saying to me, you can't prove to me God exists, and I say to you, well, you can't prove to me he doesn't exist, then our conversation is not about who can prove who, our conversation really is more about the preponderance of evidence, what does the preponderance of evidence point to, that there is a divine being outside of nature itself, or there's nothing but nature? That's kind of where we're at. So we look at me in Romans chapter 1. We're just going to read two verses from Scripture. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Romans to the church in Rome, makes just a pretty audacious claim here in these two sentences. He says, What can be known about God is plain because God has shown it to them or to us. In verse 20, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, and those are two significant phrases, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. That's a, that is a bold claim. What the Apostle Paul is saying, who wrote these words, says, God has made himself known simply by looking at what's been made. Whether you want to use the word creation or the word nature, whatever you want to say about that, just by looking at nature itself, God has made himself known clearly. And what can be seen just by looking at nature is that, number one, there is a God. And two, that God has the qualities of a divine nature. So a divine nature means that his nature is outside of creation itself. He's not a product of nature, not a product of creation, but it's outside. And then he has eternal power. So not only does he have power that you and I don't have, but his power is eternal. He did not have a creation point, and so he always has been. And the scriptures are saying you can just look at nature itself and nature itself proclaims there is a God with a divine nature and eternal power. Now that's pretty bold. 
It says when we talk about is there a God, we don't have to say, well, the scripture says, well, Bible says, well, Bible says. What we can say is just look at nature. And God has made himself known in nature if you just look. That's pretty bold. Now, is there evidence behind that? Let me uh, just state the evidence or present the evidence just by asking questions. The first question is this. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Now, about 100 years ago, this question would have been very easily dismissed. 100 years ago, the prevailing scientific attitude was that the universe just always existed. Earth was always here, the sun was always here, the moon was always here, the stars were over here, the galaxies were always here. Everything was just always here. And so you would ask the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And everyone would say, well, there's just always been something. It's just always been here. That all changed in about 1929 when Edwin Hubble, an astronomer, came up with this theory that the universe was expanding. Now, when he first brought forth this scientific theory that the universe was expanding, most of his scientific buddies uh, mocked the idea. They didn't, they didn't think he was right. Matter of fact, there was one, one scientist in mocking his idea that the universe is expanding because the obvious conclusion is if the universe is expanding, that means it's expanding from something, right? So if you work your way backwards, that means there was a single point in time when the universe began and it began to expand. And the prevailing scientific worldview was, no, everything's just always been here, and they were just mocking him, and, and one guy wrote, what do you think? There was just some big bang, and everything started? And so the phrase, big bang, originally was a term of derision, but it stuck. It stuck with this idea that there was a single point in time where everything started, and, it, and all of the universe has been expanding since then. Now, when I was a kid growing up, and I was a good Baptist church going boy, so, you know, ever from the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and I heard this phrase, Big Bang, and I always thought, well, Big Bang is science idea in contrary to creation where they explain, you know, how the world and heavens were made, and that's what they stand on. But what I've come to realize is the Big Bang idea is making it very difficult for scientists to say there is not a divine being. Because before Edwin Hubble, and Edwin Hubble had this theory in 1929, it was confirmed in the late 60s because the th scientists began to say, you know, if that theory is right, then we should be able to find this, and we should be able to find this, and we should be able to find this, and we should be able to find this. And so scientists went after trying to find that. In the late 60s, there were two physicists, and they discovered, uh, uh, the phrase just went out of my head, uh, and it's probably not coming back. But they, that they discovered this thing in the universe that if, if Hubble's theory was correct, they should be able to find. Uh, I can't believe I just forgot the phrase. Anyway, they discovered it. They won the Nobel Prize for it in physics in 1978. And so when they confirmed Hubble's theory, basically the scientific community had to say, you're right, everything is expanding. And so, but here's the problem. If everything that is is expanding, that means it comes back to a single point in time when all matter and energy began, and before that, there's nothing. How does something come out of nothing? In other words, why is there something rather than just nothing continuing to be nothing? Now, those who are committed to a worldview that says there is no God, have, have, you know, one answer they would say to that is, well, nothing doesn't really mean nothing. There's a big debate over whether nothing means nothing or nothing means something, which, you know, nothing is nothing. Uh, but another world is this, this idea of the multiverse. It's why there's something instead of nothing, and we'll come back to that when we come to the next, next point. But the scientists certainly would say, oh, well, there's, there's a reason for that. But, I, but we would simply say, do you know of anything that comes from nothing? You know, the great theologian from Sound of Music is right. You know, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. If you know what I'm talking about, raise your hand. Nobody? Okay, there's a few people about it. Oh, thank you very much. Anyway, the side, we, every, we know that something always comes from something. Something cannot come from nothing. So you look at this music stand, and no, not, none of you think, oh, that just appeared. You say, no, it came from something. There was some metal somewhere that somebody formed, fashioned, some kind of elements or something they used to make the metal. It, it came from something. There's nothing in our worldview that says something can come out of nothing. So the first way you look at nature itself, and because there was nothing, and now there is something, 
You look at that and say, how does that happen? And what Romans 1 says to us, that simple fact right there proclaims to us that there is a God with a divine nature because he's outside of creation, not a product of creation. So he's outside of creation. He has eternal power. So not only the power to create, but he's always been here. He's the always when there was nothing but God who created the something. And creation itself proclaims. Because why is there something rather than nothing? The next question that you can ask is, how does a finely tuned universe develop from an explosion? So this idea that there was nothing and then suddenly there was something, and by the way, one scientist said like this, if you were looking for a scientific explanation of what Genesis 1-1 looks like, that would be it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? But... How does a chaotic explosion produce a finely tuned universe? So reading different uh, explanations from different scientists this week, there's, there's all of these values in creation, these forces that have to be set at just certain values or you wouldn't get a universe that would function. For instance, gravity, gravitational pull. So at the beginning when all of this forms... You need enough gravity so that some of the particles coalesce together and you develop stars and planets and those kind of things. But you can't have so much gravitational pull that all of these elements begin to come back together. Or you would have the Big Bang followed by the Big Crash because everything would come collapse back on itself. So you have, need to have enough but not too much. And there's all these cosmological constants that are like that. They have to be set just so. And, and one guy I read described it like this. If you're looking at a control panel with 100 knobs, and each knob is set from 0 to 100, every single one of those is set at a very precise value, and if one of them were to be just set off by one number, the entire universe would not be able to, to exist. Or, if you like math, it's one part in 10 to the 60th power, if that makes sense to you. Or another author said, if you took all of the mass that came out of this, this explosion, and you were to add the mass of a single dime, or if you were to take away the mass of a single dime, it would have blown the whole thing apart. It wouldn't have existed. So you're talking about a fine-tuned universe that comes out of this. Now, do we know of anything where order comes out of chaos? So if a, a plane, you hear an airplane, and it flies and it crashes into the mountain, which obviously wouldn't be in Texas because we don't have any of those, but say you live in Colorado and it crashes in the mountain and you're on the emergency response team. And so you head up to the mountains and what are you expecting to find? You're expecting to find all of the metal and all of the wiring and all the computer processing and all the fabric for the seats and all of the food and everything. You're expecting that that hit the mountain and fell down to the bottom of the mountain and formed 40 Cadillac SUVs parked perfectly in a row. Of course not. You're expecting to go up there and to find a mess where everything has exploded in its absolute chaos. Because that's what we know. Uh, explosions, chaos leads chaos. Chaos does not bring order. Matter of fact, order descends into chaos. You have to have something to keep order from descending into chaos. That's why your barbecue grill rusts in the backyard. But you don't buy a rusted barbecue grill and wait for it to unrust. Right? Because we know everything decays. So I have these questions. Uh, and this is where, because scientists, if, if you're committed to a worldview that says, no, there is no God, there has to be an answer in nature, this is why they come up with the idea of the multiverse. The multiverse theory says this, there is a universe-generating machine out there churning out all of these universes. And because the odds of a functioning universe with all these 100 knobs set from 1 to, to 100, the odds of that are so incredibly you know, amazing, you have to have this machine that's just churning out a trillion different universes, and one of them will have all the knobs on the right number. Now, of course, there's no scientific evidence for that. They believe in something they cannot see and cannot prove, which sounds a lot like what they accuse us of, but... Uh, they believe in that because they're committed to a worldview that says there is no, is no God. Now, of course, all that does is push the question back. Where does the universe-creating machine come from? Uh, we're still back at the same question, but ignore that huge you know, piece in the equation. Uh, but the idea 
can, can order come out of chaos? You know, just the fact that there's life on our planet, all of the variables that have to take place for life to be on our planet. First of all, our planet has to be in the right kind of galaxy. You know there's different kinds of galaxies. Some galaxies cannot sustain life because all of the things are just chaotically random around. They're constantly hitting into each other and exploding. And, and it has to be the right kind of galaxy. It has to be in the right part of the right kind of galaxy. Not every part in the galaxy can sustain life. There's a particular place. You have to be around the right kind of star, which means you have to have the right kind of size to mass ratio because it, it gets off enough heat, but it's not so much mass that it just pulls everything into itself. You have to be the right distance from the right kind of star that's in the right piece of the right kind of galaxy. Because if you're too close to the star, then you burn up. If you're too far away from the star, then you freeze. You also have to be, your axis has to be on a tilt as you orbit around this right kind of star in the right kind of galaxy, right? Uh, because if you don't have a tilt on your axis, that means uh, that you don't have any seasons and part of your planet is going to, uh, you know, it's going to be too hot, part of it's going to be too cold. You have to have the right kind of moon. You need to have one moon that rotates around a certain, because that's how you get tides and churns the oceans and allows there to be life in the seas. You have to have the right kind of atmosphere. Yeah, there's so many different elements just for the possibility that there can be life. It's a finely tuned universe. And, that, and scientists even recognize this. That's why they're coming up with theories like the multiverse, because they realize the odds of this happening randomly is astronomical, and there's nothing in our experience, it says order comes out of chaos. But there's even a bigger question behind this. Where does life come from? If everything begins in this explosion, where do you get life? You know, do we have any idea of an, an, a, a non-living thing creating a living thing? Or, as Roman 1 says, that creation itself is proclaiming the existence of a God with a divine nature and eternal power that says there is a God when there was nothing who created something and pff, the heavens and the earth were created and then this God stepped into this expansion and puts incredible amount of order into his creation and then not only does he order his creation, he puts life into his creation. Romans 1 says, if you just look at what's been made, that has been made clear to us. Third question, where does the idea of right and wrong come from? Now, now think deeply with me about this. Where does the idea of right and wrong come from? If I were to walk out into the audience today, I, I don't see anybody who's holding a baby, but I, maybe uh, Terrell's back there, and I would take the, the Terrell baby and take it in my hands, and just start punching the baby in the face. I mean, why did y'all react to that, right? I mean, in the first service I said that, I mean, there was a lady over here, she was like, you know, just, can you believe I'd say that out loud, right? Every one of you in the room, without being told, knows that would be wrong. As far as I know, there's not a command in the Bible that says, thou shalt not punch a baby in the face. You didn't need that for you to know that was wrong. Now, where does that come from? One of the, the hottest debates we have going on in our culture right now is this whole question about same-sex marriage. You have one side that says it's right, one side that says it's wrong. They both completely disagree on their definitions of right and wrong, but do you notice both of them are arguing from the perspective that says there is a right and there is a wrong? Where does the idea of right and wrong come from. Now, if there's a God who created everything and it sits as the moral ruler over what he made and then says into what he made, this is right and this is wrong, this is how I expect you to live, that makes sense. But if there is no divine being and all we are is this explosion and this evolutionary process that has come down that has been guided by the strong survive to reproduce, the weak fade away so that they're no longer able to reproduce, and the strong survive, the weak die off. Where do you get any sense of right and wrong? In fact, the only real objective standard of right and wrong that you have from Darwinian evolutionary theory is that the strong should do all they can to survive, even if that means eliminating the weak. Now, you may not know this, but there was a theory, the late 1800s, early 1900s, called eugenics. 
if anybody's familiar with that phrase. What eugenics did was to take the Darwinian theory of evolution, which says the way we advance the species is the strong, you know, survive and the, the strongest of the fittest, that kind of thing. And they just took that theory and they began to apply it proactively, meaning for the human race to advance, we should allow the strongest to reproduce and we should not allow the weak members of the human race to reproduce. Now this, you, this moment was, this movement was gaining traction in the U.S. in the late 1800s. It was actually gaining traction in the U.S. in the early 1900s. What put an end to all that was this was the driving philosophical theory behind Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler simply took the philosophy of the eugenics movement and put it into full force. We should allow the strongest members of the human species to advance, and that means we need to eliminate the weak. And the world saw that in living color and said, that's wrong. And now no one wants anything to do with eugenics anymore. Um, but that is the only objective standard that we really have if there is no God. Is it possible to simply look at creation and come to the conclusion that Romans 1 says there is a God who has a divine nature and eternal power simply by looking at nature itself? Well, remember I told you about Edwin Hubble, 1929? He was the first scientist that said, that, hey, the universe is expanding. All the other scientists said, it's not expanding. If it's expanding, we should be able to find this and find this and find this and find this. And so scientists went after it. Uh, you remember that story? The, the scientist who took over for Edwin Hubble, after Edwin Hubble retired and then passed away, Alan Sandage, this is a quote from Alan Sandage. I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence why there is something instead of nothing. Now, this is Alan Sandage, Edwin Hubble's successor in his position. Uh, he became a believer in a divine being, in a God, and eventually actually became a believer and a follower in Jesus Christ because of what he looked at and said, I find it quite improbable that order comes out of chaos, and I don't know how else we explain the fact that there is something instead of nothing. He came to be faith in Christ. I also told you in the Edwin Hubble stubble that, in the Edwin Hubble story, that um, he said these are some things that ought to be out there that you ought to be able to find if my theory is true, and so scientists go after that, and these two scientists were able to find that thing that I can't remember the name of, uh, won the Nobel Prize for it in 1978. One of the guy, one of the two guys, uh, Arno, wrote this, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with a very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Why supernatural? Because it's outside of nature. Uh, it's organizing principle behind nature from all of this. Is it possible to look at just what is and realize and see the evidence that there is a God with a divine nature and eternal power. Now, just, just in closing, uh, I'm, not, I'm not so naive as a, you know, I'm sure that was the greatest sermon you ever heard, but if you walked in today and you've been wrestling with this question all your life, it's probably not just, you know, washed away all your questions, because you're probably sitting there going, yeah, but, yeah, but, and you're just too polite to shout them out here in the, in the middle of service. So can I invite you to this, this afternoon at 3.30 at Starbucks here in Benbrook, we've got a, a discussion group it's hosted by a guy in our church, uh, Mike Keyes. You can raise your hand. He's one of the professors at uh, a local college. And if, if you've got all these yeah, but kind of questions, and this is just kind of not the appropriate place to shout those out, I would invite you to join us at 3.30 and you know, get an expensive, expensive cup of coffee and uh, come sit down at our table and say, yeah, you said this, this, and this, but what about this, this, and this? And I uh, would love just to have a dialogue and, and have answer questions about that. That's this afternoon at 3.30 here at the lo local Starbucks. All right, advertisement for next week. Next week's question, because this is the next one you obviously get to. Oh, yeah? Well, if there's a God, 
and he's full of love and he's full of power, then why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? Right? Let me say, there's an answer to this question. It's difficult to answer, but there is an answer to this question. You may not like all the answer, but there is an answer. But, but let me tell you this. Believers in a God are not the only ones who have to answer this question. So I believe that there is a God of love and power, and you say to me, oh yeah, well then why is there pain and suffering in the world? I have to answer that question but so does the person who says there is no God. They still have to answer. <coughs> excuse, they still have to answer the question. Why is there pain and suffering? <coughs> excuse me. They still have to answer that question. And you may not like my answer totally, but I can promise you, you're really not going to like this answer. Come back next week and find out. I'm talking about, and hopefully I have my voice back. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you that you are proclaimed clearly through what has been made. And we certainly can't know everything about you. We can't look at creation and come to understand about Jesus and the cross. But we can look, and the more we find out about science, the more we come to see how how finely tuned this universe is, the more we don't understand the basic building blocks where they come, where did information come from, the more we come to know about this universe you created, the more it gives evidence of your divine nature and eternal power. So, Father, we just want to pause together as a church and we want to pray for the person that you brought to worship this morning and this question just weighs heavy on them. And Father, I just pray that you would be gracious to them and that you would open their eyes to see truth and that you would show yourself to them as they think about these things through what has been made, that you would make yourself evident to them that you exist, that you have a divine nature and you have eternal power. Father, I pray for the parents and grandparents in the room, friends, co-workers, We've got someone in our circle and at some point they're going to look to us and they're going to ask us, well, how do you know there's a God? Scripture commands us that we need to be ready. We need to have an answer for our hope. So, Father, that you would use what we talked about today to equip us, to prepare us, that when people with very deep questions ask us that we have a way to point them to truth and to simply say back to them what Romans 1 says. What's been made gives evidence that you exist with a divine nature and eternal power. So Father, would you use the truth of your word and your scripture in Romans 1 to your glory to bring people to faith in you and also to equip your church to be good representations of the gospel wherever you put us your glory and to our good. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's continue our worship this